We are what we call a conversational AI platform. The main product being our AI assistant, which was built with a really simple kind of mission to create magical experiences for candidates. Don't conduct your analysis in isolation because data is so incredibly powerful. Not defending just the tribe, but defending the organization. Those creative people that you really want to keep empowered, keep excited, keep motivated, keep thinking. A good experience pays dividends down the line. Stereotypes tend to break down in proximity. Welcome to We're Only Human, a podcast about human resources, business, technology, and the workplace. My name is Ben Eubanks, your host, and I'm so glad you're here. Hey everyone, Ben Eubanks here, host of We're Only Human, and I'm so glad to have you. One of the areas that I've been watching really closely in the last year or two is around things like digital assistance and chatbots and automation. It's changing some of the work that we do and in some exciting ways. And so today I get an opportunity to talk to Josh Zywin from Paradox. We're going to talk about some of those things. We're going to talk about what's happening in recruiting. It's going to be a great conversation. So Josh, welcome to the conversation. Thanks, Ben. Always good to chat with you. Absolutely. So before we dive into all the fun stuff that I've already laid out and, and other things, who knows what you've got in your back pocket you want to talk about, but take a second, tell us about who you are and what you do. Sure. I'll keep this part brief because nobody's really listening to hear my bio, but I am the chief marketing officer at, at a company called Paradox. If people are not familiar with Paradox, we are what we call a conversational AI platform. The main product being our AI assistant, Olivia. And Olivia was built with a really simple kind of mission, which is to create kind of magical experiences for candidates and to automate work for recruiters that frankly, they shouldn't be doing for a lot of years. And we'll talk a little bit about this as we get in uh, to the podcast, Ben, but recruiters, recruiting coordinators, TA teams in general have been forced to manage a bunch of administrative work. And what we're finding, and I'm sure you've seen, is that automation and technology can take that off their plate. And when we do, it opens the door to some really interesting uh, possibilities of, of repurposing the work that recruiters do or re repurposing the job entirely to where they're focusing their time on higher value things that have real impact on the company, on candidate experience, on all these things that we've talked about and say we care about. Um, I think they become reality when we can remove a lot of that you know, what some people call administrivia work off their plate. You said no one's going to care about your intro, but your mom is a listener, I bet. And I'm sure she would have loved a little bit more, a little bit more love for Josh. So you and I were kidding yeah. before we started recording, actually, about the fun of virtual school and balancing kids and everything else in today's world. So goodness. Jeez, yeah. Talk about things <laughs> we wish we could have a digital assistant to help us with or some conversational AI to help us with sorting through those kind of uh, things. Hey, if there's a company out there that has a digital assistant or an AI assistant that can make sure my kids are staying on task, I'll pay up right now. You can have my credit card over the phone. <laughs> I'll just piggyback off of your subscription. So we'll that way <laughs> we'll save some costs there. So let's talk about what's happening in recruiting this year of all years. And then and in, into next year, we'll be thinking about some of those in, in this conversation. But I'd love to hear from you, from your perspective, you're working with so many amazing customers, lots of really large organizations. What is the state of the union kind of in terms of what's happening in recruiting? What are you seeing? Yeah, it's really fascinating because I also happen to be married to a TA practitioner. So I get to see it daily outside of our clients. But it's interesting from the perspective that I think it it varies so much by industry, by what type of market you're in, by what type of product your, your company sells. So if you're working for an airline company or a hospitality company, recruiting in that context is very different than if you're working for Zoom or you're working for a growing company through the pandemic or, or a healthcare company. So I think it's hard to say generically, you know, what the state of the, of the union is in terms of recruiting. I think it's it so much depends on the context of of the business and the segment that they're in. But I think what we're, what I've seen at least is it's, this has created time for everybody to really evaluate their process and look at their technology and think about the way that they do things, the way that they've approached TA and recruiting in the past, and whether any of that makes any sense in the world that we're living in today and the world we're going to live in tomorrow. So is that a really generic answer? Yes. I think what I'm starting to see is there's increased focus on what technology can do to relieve work from teams. What do people do today that they probably shouldn't be doing, but they don't need to do? And then how can technology relieve them of that work and allow those folks to get back to the stuff that only people can do, which is employee wellness and employee development, learning and development, a really strong onboarding process that improves retention. It's feedback to candidates after the interview process that's real and meaningful. Maybe coaching hiring managers a little bit more 
on strategy and providing tips and, and tricks on how to you know, execute better interviews. So things like that, that I think are much higher value and potentially have a much greater impact on the candidate experience, but teams just haven't had the time to do it because they've been saddled with, you know, really poor technology in the past or a process that was built for recruiting 10 years ago. You mentioned the word earlier, and I want to circle back to that because I, I don't think I've ever heard anyone use that word to describe recruiting before. You said creating magical experiences for candidates. And I'm curious, will you talk about what that looks like for a second, a candidate that, that runs into Olivia? How is that magical? What does it feel like? Because I, that's one of the, the big, t- I want, I'll, talk, I'll comment on it a little bit. I just want to hear from you first. Why do you use the word magical? Yeah, I think it's it's a really like intentional choice of words for us. You know, if you think about Disney, like Disney, I forget what their mission statement is, but it, it's all about creating magic in their parks. And it's to me, it's magical moments or magical experiences are, are all about creating surprise, surprising someone or, or delivering an experience that they didn't expect. I think candidates are so programmed today to feel dismissed, to feel ignored, to get ghosted. They spend a ton of time applying to a job, and never hear back. So there's just like this really poor perception of what recruiting is and who recruiters are and how they do their work. That when you present them with something like Olivia or an AI assistant that can answer actual questions for them instantly and take care of some of the questions or follow-up that candidates are looking for, what they end up, I think it knocks them off their stool a little bit. Like they're surprised that a company cares enough to make sure that the candidate is taken care of through the process, that they have their questions answered, that they're followed up with in a timely manner. I think most candidates, most reasonable people are okay with being rejected for a job. I don't, I don't think everybody thinks they're always going to get the job when they apply. What they want is a fair shake and they want to be considered. And if they aren't selected, they want feedback or they want quick communication. So they're not sitting around for two weeks. In some ways, like the magic here is very simple. We're not creating some really complex AI that is making decisions for companies or ranking and selecting candidates. It's simply just communication and engagement and making sure that candidates feel respected and valued. So in my world, that's, again, it sounds simple, but recruiting doesn't have a reputation, at least in a candidate's mind of doing that in the past. So when you do actually deliver that, I think we, we see some really surprising conversations that candidates have with Olivia to the point where it's not uncommon for Olivia to get asked out on a date or for someone just to tell them about what they're doing that weekend, they end up talking to Olivia like it's a friend or like she's a friend. And I think that's, there's some real magic in that. The thing that I come back to there is no recruiter gets up, like, how can I not respond to people? How can I be unhelpful? And yet we have, there's, I've been a recruiter, right? There's lots and lots of things you have to do. And at the very bottom of the list from a business priority perspective is let's talk to every single person and have a conversation with them and engage with them. It's just, it can't be prioritized with human hands. I don't know anybody that has enough budget to make that happen. And so it, I think it changes that, that sentiment. And while that sounds soft and fuzzy, we're used to like hard metrics. There is a value to that because if you don't think there's a value to how someone feels, make them really angry and then go watch your, your Glassdoor page or your, your Google reviews yeah. page and see how people respond because they will, there's a negative cost there. And on the flip side, there's a positive cost. When you're treating them, you can respond quickly. You create some measure of relationship capital with them by just being responsive and connecting. So I want to make sure we touched on that because I love the idea, the, the term magic. And I think yeah. that's a great way of, of phrasing that. Well, and I think too, it's, it's very simple. If you think about your own consumer expectations and behaviors, if I go to an e-commerce site and they treat me like crap and it's hard to find products. You can't find information about how the products are sized or maybe they're out of inventory or you order something and then it takes three weeks to get to you. And there's no communication about when it was shipped, where it is in the process. Like you're not going to go buy from that e-commerce company ever again. Mm -hmm. And yet we're like surprised when candidates get frustrated by being treated exactly that way in the recruiting process. So I think your point about recruiters not waking up and trying to to piss off candidates is spot on. Most recruiters that I've met, most TA pros that I've met are people who are genuinely passionate about the work that they do. They know that it's important to the organization. We talk internally at Paradox about how if you can get the people thing right, you can build teams that change the world. It's this like really aspirational statement, but there's truth in the foundation of it, which is you can't build special companies and you can't build innovative companies unless you get really good people. And so I think a lot of recruiting pros, really great recruiting teams and TA teams, like they wake up every day and that's their goal. They want to have a positive impact on their organization. They want to treat people with respect. 
And, and yet I think the perception of recruiters is the opposite. And I think that's a failing of technology, a failing of process. For so long, everything's revolved around the ATS, which is not an experience platform. It's a process management platform. I agree with you completely that I think recruiters get a bad rap and I think it's not necessarily their fault. And so what we're trying to do is, is create technology that allows those recruiters to do the work they're truly passionate about. And I think that'll start to change the conversation around what recruiting really is and what good looks like. So the tools that we're talking about, Olivia and others, they're, they allow someone to show up on a website, interact with, in this case, again, Olivia, that every person gets an interaction, every person gets a conversation. They can, it can even go as far as helping to schedule interviews, things like that. And I'm curious as for those that are hearing this, like, yeah, I already know what these things do. Mm -hmm. Is there a sort of maturity curve around this? Because it's been a question I've kicked around. I'm a research guy, so I've been kicking this around a little while, thinking about how to evaluate and observe this. Because some companies I talk to that have that are still that are here in this conversation today, for example, that, oh, I, we've never actually explored that. They yeah. have a different kind of problem. They're like, let's make sure that we're having conversations. Let's create a good candidate experience. They're, they're focused on that piece of it to solve the volume problem. But then some of those that have already started using it, they start thinking, hey, we've solved this problem. What other problems can we solve? And so I'm curious, do you see that at all where companies start to get a little bit more sophisticated with how they're using the tools and ways they're enabling Olivia to have conversations? Yeah, for sure. It's super fascinating. If you look at how our product has developed over time, most of what we've created has been client driven. We started off with the theory of paradox was why is it hard for somebody to raise their hand for a job? Like the only option is you apply or you fill out a long talent network form. And then maybe you get some email communication here and there, but there's no way to get quick answers to questions. So it started out as just the way I think a lot of people think about chatbots is it sits on the career site, it answers questions, and maybe it redirects people to jobs. That's how it started. I think it's a, that's a really myopic view of what the technology can do now. And so what we've talked internally and with our clients about is our vision really is for this technology to be a communications layer between a company and its talent. When you think about it in that context, there's a lot of different touch points throughout the hiring process where Olivia can be quote unquote concierge for candidates all the way from <clears throat> that initial interaction, trying to help them find a job and maybe matching their experience, their keywords, their location to specific jobs that the company has open to answering questions about, you know, what that job actually looks like sharing employer brand videos within the conversation that helps somebody get a picture of what a day in the life of, of that, that position looks like answering questions about benefits, all the questions that somebody might have before they decide to commit to the 30 minute process of filling out an application. And then from there, it's, you talked about interview scheduling and all that. There's a ton of back and forth between the recruiter and the candidate throughout the process that historically has been managed manually. When you want to schedule an interview, it's the recruiter having to reach out and get availability from the candidate, availability from the hiring manager, pray to God in the time that they got that availability, that nothing changes, and then send out an invitation. And there's no reason why automation and you know, this idea of an assistant can't jump in and play that role and speed it up significantly, which, you know, we've seen across the board. And then beyond that, it's, we can get into a candidate NPS or candidate feedback, but ask for feedback throughout the process. When somebody comes to the career site and they search for a job, if they don't end up applying, ask them if they had a good experience, were they able to find the jobs they want? Were they able to get answers to the questions that they wanted? After the interview process, were we fair and respectful? Did you have a good experience? Virtually when the offers made, was that process easy? Was it simple to fill out paperwork? So there's different ways to capture that information, but I think an assistant comes into play really nicely by taking the work off the recruiter's plate to have to, you know, think through those communications to every single candidate, every single time. I love that example of the, the NPS piece, because you can, yeah. I can see a company that's, that's thinking, okay, we've got this process, but we're losing candidates somewhere between the very beginning and, and the offer and they're falling out. And that helps you to find out maybe, Hey, look, candidates right here said it takes way too long or it's too hard to find this piece of information or, or we're not responsive enough in this segment and we're in and they're checking out on us and so you can get some more granular insights i love goodness i could yeah you know, my, well, it's, my research it's brain like, popping exploding over here thinking about the different possibilities for having that data on hand that's, that's what we really try to push clients to think about this as a communications channel instead of a chatbot or something to answer questions or whatever there's a bunch of different use cases where you could apply this technology and what I find fascinating is that our, our clients um, tend to be really innovative and, and usually bring those use cases to us. And then we go and build product to solve them. But when you think about it in that context, it's so broad and there's so many different communication points within 
the experience that it lets your mind wander a little bit to say, okay, that's interesting. Today we're doing X, Y, Z. And what if we approach it differently by using this technology to, to solve that problem? That is so fun. So we've talked about this in some different ways. Do you have a story perhaps of a customer or an example, something like that? I don't care if it's anonymous or not. It doesn't matter to me. I'd love to hear how someone's actually using this, what those results look like so that someone listening can really get their arms around what this looks like in practice. Yeah, for sure. It's, I'm a storyteller by trade. I was a journalism major back in college, so I love good stories. I think it, it allows you to bring it to life, so I'm happy to share a few. The most recent one, uh, we actually just published a case study with Compass Group, which if you don't know Compass Group, they're, I think, like the fifth largest employer in the United States, sixth largest employer maybe, um, but right behind Amazon. They, they employ almost 300,000 people. You'd never know it because their brand isn't usually front and center, but if you've gone to a stadium, a concert, uh, a hospital, they do food service usually for all those different places. But what they typically have relied on is in-person job fairs at the different facilities that they support. So if it's a university, they would host the job fair maybe a month before students come back to school. And that was always their biggest source of recruiting. So you know, they might make 200 hires on the spot at an in-person job fair. With COVID, obviously that went away immediately. So now you're a compass group and you're trying to figure out how the heck are we going to replace our primary channel for uh, recruiting and virtual answer, virtual events are the obvious answer there. The challenge I think with a lot of companies is they say, oh my God, I've got to overhaul my entire process. I've got to implement a new technology and I've got to understand what hosting a virtual event actually means. And I don't have time. Like I've, I need to get this done yesterday. So in that case, like flexibility, agility, speed becomes super important. Can you implement this technology quickly? Is it easy to use so I don't have to coach my hiring managers or my uh, recruiters on uh, how to learn a new technology? And then will candidates actually like the experience? I don't know if you've attended a lot of virtual events, Ben, but like it's been 50-50 on whether or not it's a good experience. So what we were able to do with Compass Group is we actually launched our virtual events product right at the beginning of the pandemic, but we were able to get them up and running with an event in a matter of a day and a half or something like that. And so they hosted their first virtual event. It was such a success that over the course of 90 days, I think they hosted 75 virtual events and interact with 4,000 candidates. And I think 20% of those candidates turned into hires. So that's a real story of thinking really creatively about how this technology can be used and then having the speed to put it into action right away, as opposed to typical enterprise implementation of new technology can be two to three months. And in this case, Compass Group didn't have that time. One of the things that I've noticed, and th this story just brings it back to the forefront for me, is so many of these organizations rely purely on a single method or a single modality for engaging with candidates. And yeah. suddenly this forces them to change and hopefully long-term, even if things come back to normal at some point in the future and they have the opportunity to do that, it is my hope that these lessons we've learned, these tools we've started using, these smarter processes we've put in place, that we'll continue using those to really refine and use this to create a more, again, more personal experiences for everyone, to create better engagement with the candidates, to make sure they're connected and engaged throughout the process instead of saying, okay, we were holding our breath. Now let's go back to the old way of doing this. And it's my hope that, again, some of these tools and things we start to see and that's one, of the, one reason I asked that question a minute ago about getting smarter about how we can solve additional problems. It is my hope that we'll get smarter about those kind of things and continue that evolution in a positive way. I, don't, I haven't seen any indications anyone's holding their breath to go back. No, things, I, things weren't that great in the first place in some cases. Yeah, in some ways, like I've heard people talk about the pandemic as an accelerant for change. And I think that's a really great way to describe it. I think we've talked to a lot of TA pros and TA teams where they know what they need to do and they know what's broken. These are not unintelligent people who don't understand technology. These are people who get it. Oftentimes it's, there are lots of organizational barriers. It's um, not to pick on IT or procurement, but you, you might have an, you, you might know exactly what you want to do, exactly what you want to fix. And it's still going to take you six months to a year to do it because you've got to run through the typical enterprise process. I think that's super interesting, but I, I think it's some of those walls and barriers have been broken down by COVID because companies are saying like, we can't wait eight months. We can't wait six months. Let's step on the gas and get this thing done. But yeah, I agree completely. I think it's been really fascinating to watch the transformation. I don't think we're going to go back. I do think people are starting to think about, to your point, the different mod modalities of communication. What's really important in my mind with conversational AI, and if you want to call it chatbots, call it chatbots, is that 
the experience can't be disconnected as you go through those different channels and experiences. So if I go to a company's career site and I have a conversation with the assistant or the bot that's on their site, and then later I'm texting with that same bot, like it should recognize me. It should remember the conversation that we had. It should know ideally through an integration with the ATS, what stage of the process I'm in. And all that should be contextual and remembered so that the experience is consistent as you go through it. What we see sometimes is, you wrote a book on this literally, is that it's really easy to build a basic chat bot. That's, that technology is not difficult to build. Companies can create one very quickly. And I think they can market it in a way that it makes it feel equal to players like us and, and some of our competitors. The reality is the delta between a really basic chat bot and advanced, what I would say, call it conversational AI is pretty massive. And so think about that experience, make sure that as you go through it, you consider how your candidates are actually going to use this product, how they're going to interact with the assistant and make sure that across channels and, and across mediums that it's creating a better experience and it's consistent and, and seamless as opposed to just another fragmented tool you bolt on. Got a bunch of notes. And one of the things I wrote down that you said is this needs to be this conversations that it's having with you. Again, just like a good recruiter, it's contextual, yeah. it's continuous. It's not think about this in terms of you are interacting with a real, with a, a real person. And then tomorrow right. we're, you know, I pick up the phone and call you because I had something else to tell you. And you're like, who are you again? I need your name and all of your information. Let's start all over again. It, it's silly to, when you say it like that, but some of the tools don't have that ability to do that. They're not built for that kind of purpose. And yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there's yeah. a higher bar that needs to be set yeah. for the expectations for the buyer and what they're looking well, for. Again, I hate to, I don't think consumer experiences and consumer technology is a perfect proxy for uh, recruiting technology. Cause I think it's, there are two different experiences, two different processes and consumer, you're trying, you can literally sell to anybody and recruiting the goal is to hire one person for one job. But if you think about it, the consumer companies that really get it right. So when you go into an Apple store and you've been a long time Apple customer, they've got all your data. They know exactly who you are. They know what you bought in the past and they treat you like that. They treat you like they know you. Same thing with Delta. If you are a Delta Sky Miles member, they thank you as you're boarding the plane. And they know maybe the last place you traveled to and, and the flight attendant will come up and make a conversation about that. Marriott's another good example of a, a hotel chain that when you show up, they know who you are, how long you've been a, a customer of theirs, and they give you that respect. And I think recruiting has an opportunity to, to do the same with candidates where, again, you're only going to hire one person for one job. That usually means there's going to be a thousand people who are disappointed or let down. But just because they're going to be disappointed, just because you have to reject people, doesn't mean you can't treat them with um, dignity and respect. And I think that's the opportunity here is this assistant can act as that person who's, when you're walking into the quote unquote front door of a company, can that person, can this assistant greet you and greet your candidates like somebody at Marriott would when you walk in and you're an elite gold member? That's how candidates should be treated. I think there's an opportunity to really transform that with this type of technology. Wonderful. That's an awesome way to wrap that up. It's a mic drop, mic drop moment for you, Josh. If someone wants to get in touch, wants to learn more about Olivia, sorry, learn more about Paradox and the work that you and the team are up to, what's the best way to do that? Yeah. And really, Olivia, you're not wrong. Olivia is really what we want to expose people to. Paradox is our big brand, but Olivia is the, the one that we want everybody to meet. But the website's obviously the, a great place to start. It's paradox.ai. You can email me uh, directly anytime. It's josh at paradox.ai and all the social channels as well. LinkedIn primarily, I think is where a lot of our market lives, but reach out to us. You can actually chat with Olivia on our website. So if you're interested to get a sense of what that experience is, or you want to request a demo, she's right there waiting for anybody who comes through. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. I, I really had a lot of fun ideas that I picked up from this as I'm thinking through the research agenda for the coming year. And I'm like, there's some good things in here that, that we could dive into about how candidates feel about this, what they're thinking, what that maturity is again, because I've, I've kicked that around for a while. So I really appreciate the stories, the examples, all that you had to share. Yeah, for sure, Ben. It's a pleasure. Wonderful. To everybody else, thank you so much for joining me and Josh today on today's episode of We're Only Human. I am Ben Eubanks, and I appreciate you. I'll catch you next time. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. I'm honored to have you as a listener. If you enjoyed this episode, please take 10 seconds to rate it at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Also, if a friend that could benefit from today's conversation, please pass it their way. After all, a rising tide lifts all ships. To see show notes, sponsor information, and our full show archives, visit onlyhumanshow.com. 